So I know if it was good. So I, I think we should probably uh, go ahead and get started. I think it's about five after. So I think I think everybody in here knows me, uh, but for the sake of the video camera, because I can't get enough pictures of myself on the web or from anyplace else, or for the Ayatollah. So, uh, so I'm Jason Bankson, the Innovation Architect here at the Texas Medical Center Library. Uh, so these coding classes are kind of an experiment. We're going to see how they go. Uh, there's no definite uh, uh, termination date or anything on those, so we'll just kind of see, we'll see people continue to find them useful. Uh, this is going to be an unusual format this time because we're starting out with some really basic concepts, so it's mostly going to be me talking at you, and we're going to avoid that in the future. It's going to be more hands-on work and a few low-scale assignments, nothing to sweat or anything like that, but uh, this time around, it's going to be more about me talking about some various concepts. So, just like the slide says, getting our feet wet. And this is a great quote, I think. Uh, it's by Joseph Campbell. Computers are like Old Testament gods. Lots of rules and no mercy. <laughs> and when you're debugging a piece of code, you're banging your head against the table about it, that's exactly how you feel. You know, find some minor syntax error that's holding you up. However, as, as colorful a quote as that is, it's also a little misleading because you can give the attitude that computers, they're very problematic. And they're a source of trouble. In reality, we live in a time of plenty that's really provided by computer technology. And so I kind of like this quote, too. I do not fear computers. I fear the lack of them by Isaac Asimov. So, we're talking about coding, and so when we talk about that, we talk about programming languages, it's a useful question to start out with asking, what is a programming language? What are we talking about when we say a programming language? Who's it for? What's it do? So, somebody throw something out there. What do you guys think? What's a programming language? Anybody want to hazard a definition? Like John likes to say, safe space. So, you know, don't, don't feel like... Tell, tells the computer what you want to do. Tells the computer what you want to do. Okay. Sounds good. And so that's, and basically, I mean, it's for the computer, right? Gives the computer instructions. Let's put that to the test. <laughs> so I've got a terminal window here. Hopefully you all more or less see that. So the terminal, and it's uh, called the command line prompt in Windows. Uh, this is actually uh, more properly known as the shell. In this case, it's the bash or born again shell. This is really sort of the lowest level operating system you can realistically get down to in a computer in normal operating terms. And it's very simple, right? I type stuff in and it does. So, I'm going to type in something here. So, probably the most commonly used computer language in the world right now is JavaScript. Right? I mean, yeah, I don't have any statistics to back that up right here and now, but I'd be willing to make that bet. So let's try it. Let's, let's type in a computer language, JavaScript. I'm going to type in a little line of JavaScript that's designed to create an alert box. You know, those really annoying little boxes that pop up when you go to websites. Most of us have turned off the pop-up blockers. Let's see how it works out for us. And it did. We had syntax error. So what happened? I mean, this is a computer. It's actually a pretty nice little computer. And this is a computer language. But there's some kind of disconnect going on here. The computer can't read it. Can't read it. What do you think that is? I mean, again, it's, it's a computer language, and we've got a computer. But it's not so a language that the computer Ah, that's, that's interesting. It's not a language the computer is expecting. So that makes it sound almost like, kind of like people, computers have to be taught languages before they can understand them. Or maybe we have to interpret a language or translate it in some fashion. And this is interesting because computers are different from people, of course, in a lot of ways. And one way in which they're different is people are born not knowing any language at all. 
computers are born knowing one. And they actually never learn any other languages. The language that they're born learning is called machine code. Now, machine code is a language that essentially it, it moves stuff around in the computer processor's uh, memory. Uh, it's very, very simple, very basic. It's all numbers. And different processor architectures require different kinds of machine code, which makes sense because if, if you're moving stuff around in memory, if it's a different processor architecture, memory is going to be in a different place. So machine code that's written to run on this won't run on this. This has an ARM processor, an ARM architecture processor. This has what's called an x86 Intel architecture. You also have to think about the operating system because the operating system sits in between the system resources and the application. So anytime anything runs on a computer, it has to talk to the operating system to get access to those resources. So you also have to modify the machine code for those different operating systems to make the proper resource calls. So this is what machine code looks like. This is a simple little piece of machine code to write zeros into memory. And I can't emphasize this enough. So this is doing very little. I mean, very, it's right a few zeros in memory. It's not even putting anything up on the screen, nothing. And it's kind of a lot of stuff to write a few zeros in the, in the memory, right? Now, if you can imagine trying to program this way, and there are people who do. There are not that many of them, but there are people that can write machine code. And at one time, this was a revolution, being able to work with a computer in machine code instead of rewiring it or using punch cards or something like that. However, we can go one step up from this. There's another language called assembly language. Assembly language is really a notation system for machine code. It's designed to make machine code more human readable. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship. You say something in assembly, it can be translated into an exact command, an exact counterpart in machine code. And to do that, you use a piece of software called an assembler. And this is important because even this one little step we've taken away from machine code, the computer can't understand it. If you try and feed assembly to a computer processor, it cannot understand it. It has to be converted to machine code. So this is what assembly looks like. This is actually the same uh, set of instructions that you saw before in machine code. And it's still pretty hard to make anything out here. You can see that, however, there are a few of these uh, a few of these commands that have some English words in them, like load, store, add, things like that. So we're getting to a point where we can make a little bit of sense out of this. But imagine trying to write something as complicated as, as even a simple website or something like Word using nothing but a language like this. And it would be almost impossible to try and scale complexity up. But yeah, we're good, right? I mean, so we've got the language that computers understand, so we're ready to move forward. Right? Start writing machine code. I'll even, you know, maybe do assembly to write machine code. Who's up for that? <laughs> I don't blame So, yeah, so this, this is a mess. We don't want to try and write for computers in machine code and assembly language. We need something else. And we start to get back to that question, what are these program, who are these programming languages for? Are they for the computer or are they for us? What we need are high-level programming languages. And they will allow us to tackle that computing complexity that we can't get too easily with machine code and assembly. But if we're going to do this, if we're going to have a, a different type of programming language, a different layer, we have to find a way to turn it all into machine code, right? Because at the end of the day, everything has to end up going to machine code for that computer to understand. And that's where one of my favorite people in computer science comes in. 
a few favorites. Grace Hopper, Admiral Grace Hopper, she created the first compiler, the first practical compiler, I believe it was for the A0 programming language, but don't quote me on that, please. May not be right. Uh, so she created the first practical compiler that was designed to take a high-level programming language and turn it into machine code. Here's her quote, very interesting. I had a running compiler and nobody would touch it. They carefully told me computers could only do arithmetic. They could not do programs. So if you like the fact that you can run Word on your PC, thank Grace Hopper, the mother of modern computing software, you, you could say. And Grace Hopper, and that's like one of her many achievements, and she did that at age 47. You can see here she is near the end of her career. The Navy asked her to come back at age 63 to run their computing program, which they had run into the ground up to that point, and she fixed it for them. So take note, anybody that tells you you're too old to learn how to program a computer, you're the wrong gender, you're the wrong whatever, they don't know what they're talking about. And I love, this is a classic uh, quote of hers, she was kind of the original hacker. And we've all heard this, right? Now it's easier to ask forgiveness than it is to get permission. That was kind of her motto. She actually had a pirate flag she kept on a wall and a clock that ran backwards. <laughs> that way people came into her office and said, oh no, this is, we haven't, we've never done it this way before. Good. Say. So she wrote a compiler. So let's talk about what that means, compiled or interpreted, because there are basically two ways to take a high-level programming language and turn it into that machine code we saw that a machine can understand. You can compile it, and a compiler is a piece of software that takes that high-level programming language and turns it into a new file, or actually usually several files, of machine code that the computer can understand. So think of it like this. You've got uh, War and Peace in Russian, and you want to read it, so you send it to a translator. They translate the whole thing, produce a new version in English, give it to you. That's compiling. We also have interpreters. And interpreters work on the fly. All right. So they're more like the uh, translators you see at the UN, right? Somebody's giving a speech to the General Assembly. You have all the delegates there. They got the headphones on. In the back room someplace, there's some translator who, in the moment, is translating that speech. Now, this is an interesting comparison because when we think about it, it actually plays out pretty well. Now, one of the things you might expect, and it's true with compiled languages, is this compiled file that you get, this machine code, it runs pretty fast, right? Because it's machine code that the computer can understand. Whereas interpreted languages, that interpreter, there's a certain amount of overhead. They're generally going to run slower than a compiled language. However, if it's compiled, or it's been compiled, you have to be specific about what you're running it on. Because that machine code has to be specific. Whereas interpreted languages, those are going to run on anything with an interpreter set up on them. Now you'll notice that I got this line here. The distinction is becoming increasingly meaningless. And it really is. The reason it's becoming increasingly meaningless is interpreters are getting really, really fast and really, really good. Also, some traditionally compiled languages, like C++, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of instances now where that's running as an interpreted language with an interpreter set up on a web server, for instance. There are also compilers that have been built for some scripting languages. And when I say scripting languages, that's, uh, think of that as code, for usually that means an interpreted language. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means here in a second. But uh, there have been compilers that have been built for some scripting languages to compile them all the way down. But there are some problems with that because your traditionally interpreted languages, your scripting languages, are fundamentally different from your traditionally compiled languages. But even so, so I note down here that web code 
generally speaking, you're talking about interpreted languages with web code. Even with web code, JavaScript. So that's being interpreted on the fly in the browser of your computer. So your browser is like a computer within a computer. But even with JavaScript, you actually have different layers of interpretation and interpreters that are running, including a layer that's called a just-in-time compiler. So if, it, if your V8 JavaScript engine, for instance, looks at that JavaScript, finds a piece that says it's going to run over and over and over and over again so many times, It'll just compile it down in machine code on the fly. So it, it's getting very, there are also what are called bytecode compiled languages, uh, like Java, where you compile it down to something that's not all the way down in machine code, but it's above the high level source code. But again, we're getting this blurring of the distinctions that's been happening now for years. So it really is becoming more and more meaningful. Now, scripting languages tend to be hard to compile because a compiler does its work by having you do a lot of yours on the front end. For instance, there's a programming construct that we're going to talk about later on called variables. Not in this class, but later on down the road, called variables. A variable can, like its name implies, it can hold a value that changes over time. Now, in a traditionally compiled language, you have to tell the computer right at the beginning what kind of value you're going to put in there. Is it a string of characters? Is it a number? If it's a number, what kind of number is it? Is it an integer, floating point value, a really precise floating point value? And all of those different types of value that a variable could hold have different advantages or disadvantages, uh, depending on what you're doing. But all of that information helps the compiler figure out how to optimize that code when it turns it into machine code. All right? Scripting languages are often loosely typed. That means you can declare a variable in the beginning and not say, ah, oh, this, is, this is definitely a string. This is definitely a, an integer. The interpreter figures it out based on what you've assigned to the variable. And in many cases, you can even change the type of data that you're holding in a variable. That makes it very tough for a compiler to try and optimize the machine code that it's generating. And so even when, while you may have, in some cases, compilers designed to work with scripting languages, the end result is often not going to run that much faster than it would if it was running in an interpreter. And you know, loosely typed is one example. There are a number of more flexible rules that you'll tend to run into with scripting languages. It's good for us in some ways because it's going to make it a little bit easier to pick up things like JavaScript and that. Uh, however, it can also make our programs run a little bit slower. So, so web code made up of several languages. When I say web code, lots of languages. The big three on the client side are going to be HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now, there are other languages as well that can run the client. Uh, and there are even other languages for uh, expressing something into a web document. But those are the three important ones to know. <clears throat> and web code can be broken out into two main silos, client-side web code and server-side web code. Client-side web code, as I kind of intimated a little bit earlier, runs in your computer's browser. So when you go to a website, actually the website's going to you. It's being downloaded into your computer and it's running inside your browser. Browsers are remarkable pieces of software and they've gotten better and better over the years. So that browser is acting like a computer within a computer. It's parsing that HTML so you have something you can read on the screen. It's running the JavaScript. It's really a remarkable piece of work. Server-side languages sit on the server. Now, if you tried to, for instance, PHP, probably the most widely used server-side language out there. So if you tried to open a PHP file in your web browser, you wouldn't know what to make of it. It has no interpreter in there for PHP. PHP runs on the server, and if it's generating a website or working through a website, it expresses itself by writing client-side web code and sending it off to the computer that made a request. Now that's why in this series of classes, we're going to start out with client-side web code. 
because you can open it and test it pretty much anywhere, right? You create these files, any place you've got a browser, you can open it up and see how you're doing. Not really true with server-side script. We're going to look at some tools to help us with that. But, but also, if you're going to have any kind of real interface with a server-side script, and sometimes you don't. Uh, when I was doing a lot of data wrangling in my last job, and I wrote a lot of PHP scripts to do some really ugly conversion catalog data, uh, there was no, I didn't build a GUI for that, there was no point. It was processing a file and making a new file. But a lot of the time, you're going to have some kind of graphical user interface, a GUI, and that's going to be expressed through client-side web code. So really, before you get into server-side scripting at all, you want to know something about client-side web code. Jason, can you go back? What was that Absolutely. GUI thing? <laughs> GUI, I'm sorry. Uh, and Graphic a, interface. Graphical user interface. Graphical user interface. So, and, and really, just about everything you work with. So you saw the terminal there where I just typed in commands. So there was no graphical user interface there. Now, a graphical user interface is what we think of with pointing and clicking and that kind of thing. And for a programming language to have a graphical user interface, unless you want to program it all yourself, which often most languages have different modules that you can use. You can load in with the programming right, language. Right, right. Sort of preset things. Yeah, so basically. You have to think about them. Yeah. So you have you have certain uh, yeah certain elements you can use in some other poor schlub someplace coded for you. And the cool thing about client side web code is. All of those elements are basically taking the form of HTML and CSS, right? So, I mean, we have a very robust sort of GUI framework that exists by virtue of learning those languages. So, let's talk briefly about the Internet and the World Wide Web. I mean, the slide's up there so you can read it, but so I'll just throw the question out there anyway because I'm that kind of guy. Is the internet the same thing as the World Wide Web? No. So the internet is a network of networks. Now this is the kind of meta network that connects a lot of smaller networks together. The World Wide Web is a web of these web documents that are built with client-side web code that are interconnected and running on the internet. And they're only part of what's running on the internet. There's a whole lot of stuff running on the internet has nothing to do with the World Wide Web. Now, one useful paradigm, I think, for thinking about this is to think of the Internet as the hardware. So here's my Internet here, all my actual physical connected nodes, and really the protocols that are being used to think of that as part of the Internet. And the World Wide Web is some of the software that's running on this thing. Not even all of it, just some of it. So, that begs the next question of hypertext. So we've all heard this term, HTML, it's hypertext. What is hypertext? Kind of cool term, maybe not, I don't know. But what does it mean? Hypertext actually is an older term, it comes from the late 80s. It was coined by a journalist who uh, coined a related term called uh, hypermedia, which is actually a little bit more accurate when describing a lot of what people want to call hypertext. Essentially, all hypertext is supposed to mean is beyond regular text. So these hyperlinks that allow us to link documents together and allow us to move rapidly inside a single document give us a dimension to this text that didn't exist in plain text. So this is hypertext, beyond regular text. It's got the power. It's written with a markup language, obviously, HTML. And it's, it's important to think of this distinction, however. HTML is what you write hypertext with, but it's not really hypertext. Hypertext is what's rendered onto your screen. It's what's rendered by the browser. And if this sounds kind of simple, I should really elucidate this, too. I mean, it is by our standards now, but in the, in the early 90s, I mean, this was huge. Wow, you can jump from document to document almost instantaneously? This is amazing. So it's a pretty big deal then. 
So this works through the hypertext transfer protocol. So this is the protocol by which you actually move web documents around. Uh, basically, uh, this is for open communication. So there's a related protocol, HTTPS, which is for encrypted transmission of web documents. And uh, you navigate by use of uniform resource locators, uh, web addresses. Many of us know that way as well. That is no longer really a technical term. Now, I'm going to keep using it through this presentation because it's useful, but it, it's good to understand that that's no longer considered a technical term anymore. The correct term is URI, Uniform Resource Identifier. Now, all URLs are not URIs, uh, or excuse me, all URLs are URIs, but not all URIs are URLs. And here's, I think this is a funny story. Years ago, my first librarian job, we had a presentation of some kind. I, I don't even remember what it was now. But the presenter kept talking about URIs and was pointing to what I knew as URLs. So it ends, and I'm like, okay, you know, I'm, I, I'll admit it when I don't know something. So I grabbed a couple of my colleagues who'd been there who'd been nodding knowingly the whole time. And I'm like, so. What's the difference? I mean, I've seen these URIs. They look like URLs to me. What, what's the difference? Oh, well, no, not URI. URIs, they're, you know, they're the they're more advanced. Or, and I realized they had no friggin' clue what the difference was between URIs and URLs either. So URL actually used to be a technical term, but it's been superseded. But let's see what we mean by URLs. So here's our real entity here, the URI, Uniform Resource Identifier. And this is our traditional paradigm, which is still kind of useful for thinking about what these URLs are doing for us when we navigate on the web. So you used to have two sort of sides to this coin, actually three with the initial standard, but the third one was abandoned almost immediately. Uh, the URL and the URN, the Uniform Resource Name. Now, Uniform Resource Names are supposed to uniquely identify a resource. So they were often likened to the name of something, like an individual's name, which was kind of a really bad analogy because lots of people have the same names, but I digress. Then you have URL, and the idea here is it was also supposed to uniquely identify a resource. And this was often likened to address, which is an even worse analogy because lots of people live at the same address. But it's supposed to uniquely identify a resource, but it carried within it the information to actually get to the resource, which a URN did not have to do. So here are the parts of a URL, I'll keep doing air quotes. That's really annoying, right? And I'm going to flip it on you. URL. So here at the beginning, we have the ubiquitous uh, HTTP. We've all seen this. Really, you know, obviously it's the protocol, hypertext transfer protocol. However, that's not the only thing that we can find up here. You've probably seen links that look a little different from this. I mean, obviously we can get HTTPS as well for uh, encrypted stuff that we run into on the web, or bank sites, things like that. But you can get all kinds of other <laughs> protocols and URI schemes. If you're running a local file, for instance, you'll probably get a prefix that says file. Uh, if you're transferring files online, you may see prefixes that say FTP or SFTP. Uh, another thing that you've all probably seen is the mail to prefix. Right? Mail to, colon, and somebody's email address. So that's a URI scheme. So a browser knows when it sees that prefix, it says, oh, okay, so this isn't something I can go to like a website. I have to try and open the local email utility, and which usually ends in tears these days, as mail to links are <laughs> horrible and not, not useful anymore. But uh, another URI scheme that you can see in here, and you probably haven't seen this, maybe a few of you have, is JavaScript. 
And you can actually encode a little scrap of JavaScript as a URI and run it by clicking on it. And I actually built quite a few of those for various purposes a while back. I haven't really monkeyed with it for a while, but uh, this was actually something that was known as a bookmarklet. So you would create a URI like this. It had a little bit of JavaScript, and it had to be a little bit because you're severely limited as far as the number of characters that you can put in one of these and, and run in a browser. But uh, see, so you, you'd encode your JavaScript with that JavaScript prefix, save it as a bookmark, and uh, go to a web page, something, you click on it, and it would run like a program. Could be very useful. I actually built a bookmarklet at the University of New Mexico that rewrote the web pages of databases so that it would provide on the fly help in the database and help you navigate around and do stuff. So, next we have the domain here. So, we're all familiar with this, you know, google.com, things like that. However, as far as the computer is concerned, this doesn't really mean much, actually. This is another really interesting piece of the puzzle that was designed for people, not for the computer. The computer doesn't find the server. And that's what we're getting to with this domain. So we're getting to a particular server. It doesn't find that using this domain name. It doesn't know what this domain name is. It has to consult a network of servers. This is called a domain name service or domain name servers. And look this up and get an IP address, which is the actual way that it finds a server online. So think about that the next time you see one of these really goofy looking domains and you think, eh, this is ridiculous. Believe it or not, that was designed more for people than it was for computers. So uh, in fact, most browsers, you can actually, instead of having a domain here, you can put just a regular IP address and the browser will go to it. So once we get to the domain, if we just cut our URL off right here, what's going to happen is we'll get to the server, and whatever page has been set up as the default web page on the server, that's what we're going to get. We might not want that, though. We may want to go to a more specific page. And that's where the next section of this URL comes in. You've all seen this. The forward slashes. We have some more names. May resolve down to an actual dot something file. And we're actually going further into this folder structure. So this is, this is what we mean when we talk about the URL having the information within it to get us to an actual resource. This is telling the browser where exactly we need to go. Now, then we have this little mess right here, which uh, a lot of you librarians have seen this before on URLs in various forms. And this is where we start to be able to see where the, the idea of a URL as a technical standard breaks down. And it's been breaking down for a while. Because hypothetically, from the definition that we've already had, unique identifier for a resource. Here's our resource right here, this file, code.php. Mechanism to get us there, that's all this stuff here. We're done. But we still have this. So now we're more into URI territory. These are what are called HTTP variables. So we have a question mark, we have a this equals this, and this equals this. So these are variables that are passing information to this destination in some fashion. This is what's called a get request because it's passing the information within our URI right here. So something on the other end is going to grab these variables and do something with them. And this is actually a very useful thing to know about and a useful thing to know you can do because you can basically create links that carry information with them. When I was at the University of New Mexico, for instance, uh, people would uh, reserve study rooms. So I created QR codes for the study rooms. I, I built a little mobile app they could go to and put their reservation in with. But it seems stupid to me that they would have to enter the room number, right? Because they're right at the room. They're scanning a the QR code with their phone. So I just added HTTP variables to all the URIs with the room number and encoded those into the QR codes. So then when I scanned that QR code, they went to my mobile app and they were carrying the room number information with them. 
and the mobile app was smart enough to grab that HTTP uh, variable and fill that part of the form in for it. Now, those of you who uh, uh, use PubMed, that sort of thing a lot, you're probably used to seeing these HTTP variables that are carrying things like search terms along with them. Now, the downside to doing it this way is anybody can see that, right? So you don't want to send anything secure through a GET request, the URI. You don't want those HTTP variables. And occasionally you'll hear people say, oh, well, yeah, but if you encrypt it, if you encrypt it, you'll be fine. <laughs> no, you, you won't. You won't because remember what I said about this thing? Browser doesn't know what that is. It has to ask somebody. And when it asks somebody, it drags this along with it. So all that information ends up in the logs in somebody's domain name server. And of course, then there's also this factor. Hey, Carrie, send the UI off. You got that going on, too. But these actually will end up in a lot of different places, even if this is an encrypted transmission. So you want to secure it in any form, don't use a GET request. And we'll talk later on as we progress about what that means. There are other kinds of requests, like POST, that you can use that are going to be a little more secure. So, covered a lot of ground, kind of basic concepts about the web, about what programming languages are. So now it's my favorite part of the whole thing. Stump to chump. <laughs> <laughs> so, any questions that you've got? And, uh, of course, as we progress with these classes, I guarantee you guys are going to have questions that I don't necessarily have the answer to. And that happens. I'll go and look it up and come back and act all sage and rub my chin and, you know, act like it's no big thing and then give me the answer. But, in the meantime, do you have any questions? What do you, what do you guys have for me? Right, safe space. How does HTTPS make your URI encrypted? Why is the addition of the S so make it so different that okay. it's more secure? This is actually an interesting topic. This requires a bit of explanation, if you guys are willing to hang with me, because it gets a little bit complicated, but this is this is actually a really important concept for the web. So encryption. All right. Encrypting on one end, decrypting on the other. The strongest encryption that we have available right now are through what are called symmetric encryption algorithms. That means you use the same key to encrypt something that you use to decrypt it. They're very, very strong, almost unbreakable if you use a long enough, random enough key. Now here's the problem. So I have my secret message and I want to send it to Joanne. So I encrypt it with this really strong algorithm, this really strong key. It makes it, if somebody intercepts it, it's just gobbledygook to them. How do I get my secret key to Joanne safely? Because if somebody grabs that, then they can decrypt the message. The whole thing is pointless, right? It doesn't matter how good my encryption is. So what I need is a different system called asymmetric encryption, or public key encryption. And with public key encryption, you have two different keys. You have one key that actually encrypts the message, and you have a second key that decrypts the message. So the encryption key, the public key, you give to everybody. Everybody gets that one. And you have to keep your, uh, your decryption key private. So anybody on the web can say, oh, I'm going to send this encrypted message to Joanne. Here's her public key. Won't encrypt it on my end, so I send it to you. Then you get it, you decrypt it, you're good. Nobody, had, you know, you, you don't have to send that, that key back and forth. Now here's the, here's the trick. That asymmetric encryption is really computationally intensive. So it's not practical to send all of your messages with asymmetric encryption. That symmetric encryption is super strong. It's actually better than asymmetric encryption. And it takes far fewer computing resources. So what normally happens with encrypted transmissions on the web 
is I go and I get your public key, and I use it to encrypt another key, a symmetric key. I send that to you, you decrypt it with your private key. Now we both have safely exchanged a key, and we can communicate using symmetric encryption. So that's how that works, and that's why you see that HTTPS. So you're seeing that, but if somebody were to intercept that transmission, once you've created that handshake, once you've begun the encryption process, if somebody were to intercept your transmissions at that point, they're just going to get gobbledygook unless they have a key and they can open it up. But just between you and it. Exactly. Now, there are a lot of problems with asymmetric encryption, public key encryption. You guys have probably heard about some of this. Keys get stolen. The government forcing companies to give keys up happens a lot. I mean, our government basically just gives you keys. And there are businesses that have closed up shop because they refuse to play ball this, you know, that way. But that's a problem, right? How do you deal with the whole steel pipe, give me your keys issue? And there is a solution to that. Uh, actually, uh, it's something I talk about in my next publication, the Journal of Hospital Librarianship, my article, uh, Quantum Computing and the Medical Librarian. But I'll give you guys a preview, if you don't want me to shut up about this already. I'm willing to do that. OK. This alternative system is called quantum key distribution. So again, that symmetric encryption, still really strong, still really good. And even with the next generation of computers, what are called quantum computers, which are capable of solving problems by basically exploring many solutions simultaneously, unlike modern computers, which have to explore them one at a time for the most part. Even with those computers, symmetric algorithms are still so strong that nobody anticipates quantum computers will be able to crack those. They will probably be able to crack asymmetric encryption, however. But our alternative is quantum key encryption. So here's one of the interesting problem or uh, properties of things at the quantum level. Observing changes things. So if I send a key and I encode it as several quantum states, and I send it to Joanne, and she looks at it, she gets these quantum states that she's received. So basically, a particle can be in many states. It's in a superposition of states. So if I describe this series of quantum states, send them to you. And you send a few of them back. You make sure that we're marriaging up. And everything looks good. We're golden. So if I use that and send an, a, a symmetric encryption key to you, you can be assured nobody's intercepted it. However, if those particle, particle states, those spin states, have changed, any of those states that I check on, if there's been a change, that means someone has observed that transmission. I know it sounds weird and kind of counterintuitive, but it's baked into the laws of physics. There is no way around it. And so then you know, uh-oh, somebody's got our key. OK, we're sending it again. Or we're trying a different channel. And we'll keep trying until we see that nobody has changed the quantum states of these particles. And then we know we've got a safe key. When you say a key, it is really just a line of code, right? That's specific to that event. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah. It's uh, basically it could be. Uh, it, it's usually alphanumeric, but it's essentially something you plug into an algorithm. When I use the word algorithm, do you guys know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So you're plugging it into an algorithm, and you're using it to, you know, apply to a larger set of what's called ciphertext, your encrypted text. And so this, this key that you're using, so for instance, an asymmetric encryption key, which is going to be all numeric, OK? An asymmetric encryption key is based on problems of factorization, prime factorization. So you have really huge numbers that only have two factors that you can, two or two prime factors that you can extract. One of them becomes the public key, one becomes the private key. Now, a computer, to figure out this, this problem, to figure out what the two prime factors of a really, really, really huge prime number is, this is enormously computationally intensive. 
For modern digital computers, we're talking, in some cases, if it's a long enough key to solve that math problem, thousands of years. Thousands of years. Not true for quantum computers, theoretically. Uh, there's enough qubits in the processor, theoretically, to solve those very, very rapidly. But, so essentially, you're talking about uh, what amounts to math problems in many cases, that in, in these keys are the solution to those. So, hopefully that, a great question, by the way. Hopefully that made sense and put everybody to sleep. Make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Or are you just nodding because you want me to stop talking? <laughs> no, we're fine. <laughs> I can take it. It's great. <laughs> All right, uh, any other questions for me? Safe space. I've covered this topic so thoroughly and masterfully, or maybe it's so basic that you all knew this stuff already. Yes? Um, can you explain? I noticed that, well, I, um, I don't know much about computers or whatnot, but I, one thing I did share with the class that I taught for um, seniors that weren't really familiar with internet searching. Mm -hmm. To look at, I, I call it the watermark or the icon on the the um, address bar. Okay. It's okay. Created by a company is that encoded as well? Because it's in the let's say you know we, we all know like Home Depot has a particular logo, and so it's prevent from false websites to advertise as Home Depot. But since it has that that, uh, that logo at the in the address bar, they can identify that's the that's a good question. So, and in, in actually the answer to that is it depends a little bit. So, for instance, there's one kind of logo that are, will appear in a tab. Right. All right. So that's, anybody can do that. It's called a fave icon, and you just set that in your, uh, in your web code. That's really easy to do. You can talk about how to do that. Uh, in terms of some of the stuff you'll see in the address bar, like sometimes you go to a bank, you get that little green bar, oh, protected by yakety snackety. Um, in many cases, those are services that the organization pays for, and so these things are recognized by some browsers. And, and it, they're not baked into everything, but you can think of this like when I talk about asymmetric uh, encryption, and you can get uh, what are called certificates mm -hmm. that, you know. Um, so those are normally provided by trusted providers, certain companies that you buy certificates from. And send so the browser, when it gets to that secure site, says, oh, okay, this is a good certificate. I trust this certificate. You know, don't worry about it. You can also generate your own self-signed certificates, and those are the ones when you go to a website, and, ah, we don't know the certificate. Yeah, this is a mess. You, you fool. That's, uh, and, and you run in that a lot. That's normally a self-signed certificate. And so you have a similar thing going on with some of what you see in the, in the URI, uh, uh, URI bar. Hopefully it answers your question. Yeah. Would you make your slides available? I already have. Okay, great. So uh, I should mention, so I, I made a live guide for the class. Okay. And um, so each class as I do it, you can see I'm recording the session here. So I'll try and record both sessions and see if any of the footage is salvageable or if, you know, it's like space balls and dark helmet, never show that again. Could be possible, doable. I don't know. Um, but the slides are actually already up. I just converted them over to Google, uh, uh, the Google format and I've embedded them in the class one page of live guide. So. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. I do what I can. So education, I mean, you hear these terms and you think about them, but I mean, unless somebody puts them in the right, you know, chronological order, it's it's hard to, and if, if you're not in that computing environment, it's it's really hard to, to grasp it in yeah. terms of this builds upon this, this at least for me. I yeah, guess. no, you're, you're right, you're right. And of course these things change. As I mentioned, URL at one time was a technical term. It was a fully legitimate technical term. There were tech, there was technical documentation generated by the World Wide Web Consortium mm -hmm. describing what a URL was. That's all been superseded. So when Somebody says to me, the link's broken. It means there is some code in the URL that either has been omitted, or it's incorrect, 
or maybe that's, that's for another class. Well, well, well that, that could be the case. Nine times out of ten, when you have a link that's broken, mm -hmm. uh, it means that the link probably worked initially. It probably gave the correct path to get to a resource, and then somebody moved the file or deleted it. And so okay. the path is no longer accurate for getting okay. to the resource. Um, Awesome. Well, next time, beginning HTML. It looks like a superhero logo. It's HTML5 shield. Uh, and so next time, we're actually going to start some hands-on stuff. I actually got some jump drives also. They have a few resources on them that I'm going to hand out to folks. Uh, that's kind of why I'm getting everybody's name, so I have an idea. If I have enough of them, I think we're, we may have to order a few more. But uh, And so we'll actually start building some HTML. We're going to talk about what markup languages actually are and what HTML is. And we're also going to talk a lot about the document object model. Now, I'm not going to belabor that point today because we're not talking about it today, but remember that term, the document object model. Very, very important. And a lot of people who write web code, client-side web code, really don't know much about the document object model. And it causes them no end of problems. So, all right, awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, guys. Yeah.